that data is available to you. Okay? Does that yes. work? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. So then when we talk about planning, these are all things that happen in general in methods classes or throughout colleges of education. We have, we have our students identify uh, essential questions in the common core of the state and context, content and process structures and, and that's part of your central focus. So what is this unit about? Well it's going to be about wellness and how it relates to one's own personal um, goals of how they want to run their lives as far as that would could concern. And then you look at your knowledge of students, you want your assets and research related to learning. So this is the difference. So what I have my students do is along these lines, when we get to knowledge of students and instructional strategies, I say, well, so whose research is that about? And so they do a paper, they each choose a different instructional strategy. And I think I have my, oh, this is my list. On the second page of your handout, this was what my students did. They, they got to choose a type of learner. And so what they were to do was to look up a research study about how to teach that type of learner. What's the research that's going on with this? And so we had African American students, gifted students, Native American students, autistic, Hispanic boys, boys over age students, students with cancer, um, English language learners, so what I did is each person had to come up with a study about that and then we collaborated on what those different tools were and then we looked for commonalities across and they were they're like gosh every one of them wants you to use visual images or hands on you know the research out there is consistent that young adolescent learners need to be engaged in what's happening so this not only provides our candidates with some um, best practice strategies dealing with these types of learners, but it also begins to look at the commonalities of what happens in your classroom, of what children need. So that was kind of a fun activity that they, they did with that one. Questions? Yes? You with me? Good. So this is the one that hurt me the most with EdTPA. <laughs> And it hurt my students the most. Uh, it doesn't hurt, it no longer hurts me, all right? It's, it's kind of like knowing the difference between dolphin and, I mean, mahi-mahi and dolphin. You know, they are the same fish. The dolphin is not flipper. And so when people were wanting to order seafood and they saw dolphin on the mint, uh, I know some of you know who flipper was. But they're like, oh, I can't eat flippers like you can't eat Bambi, right? You know, but when you heard Mahi Mahi, you're like, oh, that sounds so exotic and Hawaiian and tropical, that'd be fabulous. So, not that it's, it's that good of an analogy. Okay. But it's the idea that um, these are, actually, they're not language functions. Can you correct that on your um, thing? They're called language demands. Are we amongst them around here? So it's about language, one of in four quadrants, language demands. In your world of teaching students how to do unit planning, my sense is that it's somewhere in that unit plan there had to be vocabulary. Yeah? That's the best piece of it. You know, that is a language demand. Right? The vocabulary and how you teach vocabulary, how you introduce vocabulary, and in your schools how you want word walls in vocabulary, and you want images to go along with your vocabulary, and you want experiences with vocabulary, the scavenger hunts and all those things with vocabulary. And so the easiest one for me to tell you about is, lang is vocabulary as a language demand. It is, it is something that is needed. It's demanded upon in order for students to understand content process and product all along the way. And so one of the things though that happens with English language learners is that vocabulary is more than content vocabulary. Because if I say, um, give me a line. Well in math, if I want you to give me a line, I want you to draw something with a ruler, right? But if I'm in the theater class and I say, give me a line, then you want to say, to be or not to be. 
You know, so there's this, all this notion of a line is a line unless you're an English language learner and suddenly you don't know what they are, or am I going fishing with my grandfather? A line. So this whole idea that language, vocabulary for people who have not grown up with the vocabulary, it can be very difficult. So you have content vocabulary, but then you have this everyday vocabulary that can mean different things. So vocabulary is a, a very important language to me. The second one, the language function, which I gave that whole title there, I was like, I'm so embarrassed. The whole idea of language function, to me, it's when you think about what is the what is the verb in your in your unit, in your objective? What is it you want them to do? What is it that has to happen in your classroom? It's not content, it's how are they going to show their learning? What is the critical thinking that's going to take place in this lesson? And the difference here, so for each of the ed TPA manuals, they have uh, language function, and they actually give you different words to choose from. And in ed TPA, all you have to choose is one. You choose one language function that you are focusing on for those three days. And so that's the thread. That is the golden thread that's being woven through those, through your unit plan. And so when I would ask my students, yeah, I want them to, in math, it's compare and contrast, I think in, in science, uh, or it may be prove, might be something that's in the math one, and that sort of thing, so that everything is about what does, what does it mean to summarize? So if I ask you to summarize something, chances are you can do it. But middle school students, you ask them to summarize, they have no idea, they'll write everything down. So you have to actually teach them how to do that. And so you're actually teaching that in your lesson. So it's a, like a mini lesson. I, I watch art teachers very often. They have students working on things, and they'll say, come up here, let me show you how to paint glaze correctly. I'm going to give you a little mini lesson on glaze. Let me give you a little mini lesson on compare and contrast. You know, So you may start your warm-up with a compare and contrast of something, two things you love, you love to do. You know, what's similar, what's different in there. And so you're actually teaching them that language function. So the function is no different than what you have had your students do, but it's being more intentional about teaching that function to the students. So it can be a mini part. Maybe it's part of the warm-up. Maybe it's part of the engage that you do with your students. So they get involved in something, and then here's the mini, the mini lesson that we're doing. And then you can come back to that if it's a compare, I love compare and contrast, because then you can come at the end of your lesson and you want your students to compare and contrast two things that you worked with that day. And so the whole world can be around that whole compare and contrast. And you're intentional in your writing of your lesson plan, this is the language function we're working on today. It's so easy to grade somebody's at TPA where they're using the language, where I don't have to interpret what it is they're doing. Do you have any background on this language function? Why is that the term that they use? So that's a really good question. Oh. I have no idea. It and it's frustrating. Is, is it true? It doesn't make any sense. It mean, like, I well, can't put language and function together in a way that defines what it's what it wants right there. The verb, the what we see students doing or what we hear them saying. I just don't. I don't know. So I was hoping maybe you had some. That would be a really nice thing to make up. <laughs> Anybody have any idea? I mean, this is where we struggle. It's like, what? I mean, language purpose, language purpose. The function. What's the function of language? The function of language is to be able to summarize, to evaluate, mm -hmm. to compare. Is that the function of language? To communicate and how we communicate? Uh, I'm making it up. Sorry, you can hold that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just a messy place in the field. Years ago, it would have been called mode, and the word modes got tarnished. Oh, um, so it used to be a mode. About things like comparison and contrast, summary, evaluate, I mean, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of things in curricula were based on all those things. Mm -hmm. And then it sounded like a oh, lockbox. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's a pejorative term. Oh, I love and that. it comes and goes. There it is. I like Marzano taking Bloom's taxonomy and giving it new words. So sorry. Yeah, there. 
The next one is, is also challenging, is syntax. Now I get it in math. Did, if you have a calculator, have you ever punched something in? And what happens if it doesn't work? What does it tell you? Syntax error. Syntax error. It will tell you. So very often in math, it's where your parentheses are if you've used the right keys, the syntax. And in language, the syntax kind of makes sense. Um, so very often, so what they'll tell you in Ed GPA, you have to use a language function and at least one of the other language demands. So you do not have to integrate all four of these in Ed GPA. Your students do not. But there does have to be a language function. So yes, you can do that. But the, but the fourth one, so the syntax, written responses, grammar, order of operations, the meaning of symbols, that's syntax. You know, so that's part of the communication of your content, your subject that you're working with. The last one, which I find um, very interesting and very doable in any unit plan, less than, has to do with discourse. How are students talking about the content? So that if you're in a, if you're using a think, pair, share discourse, that you're having your students communicate, you have specific questions, deeper thinking questions, where they're having to compare and contrast together, working together, you can say that this is the, the type of discourse activities we're using. You can actually use those words. It's not taking away from the idea that you want your students to talk about whatever the content is. You can, we know that you cannot just lecture to middle school students for 50 minutes and then ask them to summarize it at the end. We know that you, if you go into chunks of time, and there was some research out recently about college chemistry students and how long they can take in information, um, and it's about five minutes, maybe seven, then there has to be some kind of break in there so that they process with some information. So that when I give you these little stickables on here and you have a chance to write something down, best practice would be that I would stop and say, write something down and share it with your neighbor. So we teach our students how to do it. We don't model it sometimes really well, but it's this idea um, that there needs to be time to think about what happens in there. So that if in their unit planning, they're coming up with a topic, there is vocabulary that has to be presented in some way, or that students have to present in some way, that there is a language function that you are actually teaching your students how to do, and there that's threaded through, that's happening there. These are the pieces that are coming together. Question? A lot of your discourse could be um, how, they, how they're pulling everything together. But a lot of times the conversations that take place in the classroom are really important. I had to throw in a piece of technology because I love it. And so, a TPA does not make you do that, but I had to give it to you. So sorry, so we can skip it almost. Except that I, I have it here and I want you to play with it. Uh, it's the idea that technology, we were talking about this earlier today, that technology, for technology use is not really useful. You know, you're just throwing technology in there because you have to. And EdTPA does not ask you to use technology. It does not require you to use technology in any way. I know in our lessons, we want our students to be able to create technology-based units and that sort of thing. And so it can be part of what's happening in there. But I believe that technology falls into four categories. And one of, in the first category, which is in the first quadrant, has to do with research. We use the internet to do research. We go online with, through our libraries to get information. We read books through technology these days. And so one of the things to be teaching our students is the ethics and what is appropriate in the use of technology. But I don't think it's just in quadrant one. I think it, it flows through all four quadrants. So if we drew a, a squiggly line through all four of these quadrants, and that has to do with ethics and what's appropriate and how to cite sources, that's what we're dealing with. So that in, in quadrant two, it's how we as teachers share information using technology. So that if I put up a simulation, or if I put up um, a PowerPoint, or if I use a Prezi, or whatever it is I have created to share information 
That is still a very low level of using technology, but it's different than doing the research. Because you can share my presentation, you may not know as much as I do about it, or I may, but I can still use other people's stuff. And you're welcome to use it at any time. The third quadrant I have here is that when students use technology to gain information. So that if you create a web quest, or uh, that's kind of an old term, or that if you have a podcast, or if you have, um, if you have a flipped classroom where the students are doing something with information on independently of you, then that's quadrant three. And where quadrant four is where students communicate their own knowledge using technology. So if they create a visual from a videotape that they have put together, then they are actually showing that they know content or how and process how to use this to show their information. And so that's kind of a fun piece there where you could almost thread some of the information that you're talking about in your unit through that. But I had to throw that in there because I, I had to. <laughs> I'm so sorry. A little extra. Okay, and so then we have instruction. So what happens in instruction, um, these are, are three of the four things that we look for in EdTPA. One is that there is a positive learning environment. This is very hard and, and difficult. We've had this conversation on the and the training stuff, what if a student teacher is in a very challenging class? That's a very good question. Can you do just positive framing? I mean, can, can the student teacher do good things, even you know, if it doesn't necessarily result in what you want it to, but if you do? If yes, if they're going through the motions of what makes a positive learning environment, and they have a chance to reflect on that as well in Ed TPA, and so you would look back on it, and you could say in the planning commentary, this is a very challenging class, and so my teacher and I, we use a very um, behavioristic pattern of classroom management with these students, but in her tape, so she gets to choose that 10 minutes, or he gets to choose that 12 minutes, it's there, that there is a point where that teacher is working one-on-one -on -one with the two of you where you all are engaged, so you're hunting for that magic in there. And that, yeah, that's the only part that we actually see on the videotape, that 10 minutes or a total of 15 minutes. It shows um, a positive learning drive. That whole notion of mutual respect and rapport and response. Hopefully, somewhere in their student teaching, there is at least one class that is going to have that piece. Do you find that you they get better scores you see more what they're looking for if they have some whole class instruction and then some small group instruction? Is there two clips? There can be two clips in it. Um, what they're not really looking at is that you're a good lecturer. Mm -hmm. They're really looking at these pieces, the engaged and so deeper the whole thing. Be small group? It could be, okay. yeah. And so students are engaged in a science experiment where they're having to answer questions and they're having to compare what happened before. And so the, te the supervising teacher may have the camera, but I've seen it also and the supervising teacher gets it and then she's walking over here, taping, and we've had some, so training the cooperating teachers how to do that. But often I just have my students put it up in the back of the room. Um, and what they say, there are some kind of microphones that you can get where it can, uh, a mic can pick up what the teacher is actually saying, and so the conversation that is happening there um, is something, yeah. How do you handle getting permission from all the people who end up on the video? You have to get, there's a permission form in the EdTPA, there's resources that are available to everyone. There's an, we used a, a common video form. Most of the schools have permission from students and know who the students are that are not allowed to be videotaped, but we actually had our students um, give it to the class that they were going to videotape in anyway, and so it's kind of a double coverage of what's happening. But you don't have to get IRB approval because it's, it's not being used for research and it is private and it just goes to um, Pearson as far as that goes. Did we get microphones? We did. We have external mics. External. We actually needed to um, get um, 
our next thing is we have to get extenders. That, um, and we also have permissions. Oh, that that's been, a good question to have with. And we have them vetted through our attorney here as well as. We what got the mini iPads for students to use to. To the videotape video itself, and I've used, had them just use the flip cameras, and I think I had students who had it just on their phone. Yeah. We had some right. laptops, but they're specifically used, and they've got, Holly's got a system, they've got to, and then her GA, and then to check them out, and those, yeah, we have them in the library that yeah. students can check out, but we don't have a lot of students in there. And what is your system you use to upload? Do you have live text? Do you have, what's your? We have task stream. We're running into issues with storage. Yes. What are, what are people doing about these giant files? The giant Well, files. we have on the iPad, uh, and now our instructional technology guy is the one who's figured it all out. I, just, I can tell you what we have, but I don't know how it works. <laughs> um, we have, um, they can video on the mini iPad, and they can compress it on the mini iPad, and then upload it to live text. So the file is not gargantuan because it's compressed. And it has to be compressed to go to um, Pearson. Pearson. But, um, and then because it's storage, um, Chris is trying to keep them to, um, in the habit of putting it up on live text. Just right As opposed to in your Google Docs or mm -hmm. something. Um, and because it's 10 minutes, that is, that is helpful. But and that would be a really good question for your tech. Your, what's her name? Sheila. Yeah, yeah. she's on that test me, and this is on issues. Oh, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. The problem must be that they're recording hours worth. Of and it. they really need to, I think. I to think find they really what, need yeah. Because I was telling them, I tell them record all three days on all the lessons. And especially if you do it like the semester before they're actually student teaching, yeah. whenever they like put all this work into this giant unit plan that they probably want to use on their portfolio when they go to apply for a job where they could show clips. Uh, this is a, um, an example of my positive learning environment. And then the principal's like, oh, you get it, that that's important. And here's engaged learners. And here's an example of deeper thinking and the questions that I'm asking my students here. And here are some of their, pro you know, they could actually create that. But yeah, I think that's a really good point you know, that we're talking about. And we're getting better, we're getting better information from all these tech people who can help us think in terms of compression. And a lot of times, also, when you're videotaping something, you can put it on a, um, whatever it is where it's a smaller file that they're taping from. You know what I'm talking about? So I know when I used to have that old time digital camera that had the flop, the three and a half inch floppies in it, I could or I could do something on the settings that either made it a really lots of pixels high quality and I could get eight shots on a disc, or I could make it smaller number where I could get 37 shots on a disc. Mm -hmm. And so that can kind of do that too. Okay. So I think I have one more for this. Has to do with the assessment. And with EdTPA, what they they ask you to just choose one assessment tool to analyze student learning in there and to look at the different parts. And when you look at the rubrics that are with EdTPA, uh, it's, it's so much like what we've done in the past. The difference is, for me was that they had to choose three students and one of them had to do from No Child Left Behind, you know, or um, a a diverse learner in some capacity that you then looked at them and how they compare to the rest of the group. And so doing the graph graphs that you may have done pre and post assessment, that can be part of it, but for the most part you're looking at the post. And so to go back to the very beginning when they said, and people say they don't have you do a pre-assessment in at TPA, but they do ask you how do you know what you're why are you doing what you're doing? And you can say on the pre-assessment that I had with my students, I I found that 80% of my students were unable to tell me what a fraction was. And then I had 20% of my students who could, and so when we we're starting this whole unit, I'm using those students to actually do some of their own project-based learning over here while we're still reading. So you can use the pre I, I think pre-assessment is so important for our candidates to learn how to do, because data-driven decision-making is so powerful in what's happening in schools. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. So when you're an official 
24. I have not signed up to do that yet. I would um, highly recommend that you all do. I know. Just we so need, you we have figured several, out. But we need, I mean, we, in, in time, I think. Um, but say you're looking at a portfolio and mm -hmm. they have that component, they've done a pre assessment. And mm -hmm. say, how much assessing are you doing on your own about, well, that was a, a good horrible tool? assessment? No, you I cannot do that. So. You so cannot judge. Bad. Are they are they producing what and are they about? using it with fidelity? Right. I mean, it's not about whether you where that was a great yeah, I can't say yeah, yeah. that was a really gross I mean what, I, I would have done a much I would have yeah. done, done a different mm -hmm. that's what I thought. But right. I just Do they have a plan in there? Is it going from one point to another point? You know, are they integrating vocabulary? Are they doing all these pieces? Are the students engaged? Because, and what happens when you do it, uh, a portfolio assessment, you're going back and forth to their context for learning, to their plan. You're always going, and while you score one section at a time, you, I'm always going back to see if, well, how did this, what video clip they put there, what was the rest of the, what's the bigger picture, and that's based on the, the lesson. They also have page restrictions. So those candidates of ours who are very prolific in their ideas and their writing and they do beautiful things and they go on and on and on and on, they can't do that. Okay, so they have to be concise. But it's doable. And my students who did it, um, the first time I had, I had student teachers when we were piloting this, and I said, we're going to play with EdTPA and it's, it's going to be fun. We're, you know, this is going to be great. You're going to love it. You know? And so we started with the rubrics and, and looked at them. And right now, with my students who will be student teaching in the spring, we're only doing the planning commentary. I'm showing them evidence, task two and three, the task two. They do have to videotape themselves, and so we'll use those rubrics to kind of play with because it's not mandated with us. But the other thing that faculty have said across North Carolina, by the way, they say, Welcome. We're happy that you're playing with this, that there's somebody south who knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so we look forward to hearing what you all are up to, and we commend you all in your want, your desire to make it happen, uh, because it has happened, and that you're, to embrace the tool is, is what has to happen. And so really the collaboration among other faculty of how you're in, integrating at TPA, what's working for you so that when you all get together at the Georgia Middle School Conference in February, you can say, oh, mercy, don't forget about this. You know, or, and my students were like, yeah, I had to think harder than I've ever had to think in creating this piece. <laughs> but realize that during student teaching, when they actually do it, it's a three day. It's a segment. It's not the entire unit. And so they're gonna choose three days. And I had students who chose three days at the beginning and decided to do it again in March. So they actually kind of tried out three days, kind of a little process playing, because your context for learning is the same. A lot of your structures are the same. And then they said, I got a lot better at they I love them. I got a lot better at it in March than I was in January. And I love that. You know, it's like, do not be afraid of it. And right now, especially if they're paying for you to pilot this and see, you've got good candidates out there who are doing good work. And my students were able to give me lots of information about, we can do this. They were fearless. Wait. Yeah. Yes, even so there it is. <laughs> it's like, and start with three. So you start with three. What is the minimum? That's what I did with mine. You're shooting for a three right here. A three is going to get you through what happened. And so if they didn't get a three for me, they had to redo something as far as that. So I hope that gives you a little bit of encouragement. And we're here up north, north of you to help. There's people all around up there who are, are still piloting it, even though we're not being required to do it. And I'm one of them. We have a K-6 person in, at UNCA who she and I have played a lot together. The more you can talk with somebody else with about it, um, the happier you'll be. So, good luck. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs>